The Medal of Honor is, a, is the United States of America's highest military honor, and it is awarded for personal acts of valor above and beyond the call of duty. The medal is awarded by the President of the United States in the name of the U.S. Congress. The Medal of Honor was created in 1861, and several years later, on March 25, 1863, the first Medal of Honor was presented to U.S. Army Private Jacob Parrott. Since then, only 3,470 Medals of Honor have been awarded to America's sail soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen. 3,470 represents a very, very small fraction of the tens of millions of men and women who have served America in uniform. And as of today, there are only 79 living recipients of the Medal of Honor, and I'm pleased to be here with two of these great American heroes. Our first panelist uh, served in the United States Marine Corps for 20 se 27 years and received the Medal of Honor for Valor during the Vietnam War. He retired from the Marine Corps in 1989 and served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Reserve Affairs from July 2001 until January 2009. He also served as Acting Assistant Secretary of the Navy from January through, uh, from January through April 2009. Please welcome Medal of Honor recipient, U.S. Marine Colonel H.C. Barney Barnum. <laughs> Our second panelist served in the United States Army for 26 years. He was one of, one of America's first soldiers to don the Green Beret authorized by President Kennedy to be worn by the Special Forces. He served two tours of duty in Vietnam and also served in the Dominican Republic and Panama. On September 17, 1969, his heroic actions in Vietnam earned him America's highest military award. After more than 45 years, he finally received the recognition he deserved and dec was decorated with the Medal of Honor by President Obama in March of this year. Please welcome Medal of Honor recipient, U.S. Army Sergeant First Class, Melvin Morris. <laughs> I've prepared a few questions um, for our panelists, but I'll uh, certainly give all of you plenty of time later on uh, for your questions as well, and, and we'll have a good discussion with the, our panelists. Uh, but before we get started, I encourage all of you to uh, visit the Medal of Honor Society website at www.cmohs.org, uh, where you can learn about all Medal of Honor recipients and read their citations as well. And if you're ever down in Charleston, I uh, encourage you to visit the Medal of Honor Society Museum aboard the USS Yorktown down in Patriots Point, uh, South Carolina. So Colonel Barnum, I'd like to start with you, sir. You ready? Okay. Uh, what were some of your, let's talk about some of your role models early in your life when you were growing up in, in Connecticut. Well, I think uh, my role models, first of all, were mom and dad. Uh, we came from a small uh, town in, in Connecticut. Uh, we didn't have much, but we had everything. Uh, dad worked three and four jobs, and mom was a, was a homemaker. Then I think probably uh, scouting made a, a big, made a big difference in my life. And I think much of what I learned in scouting carried on to my career as a Marine and the leadership aspects. and first aid and living in the field and and uh, and I guess my coach and I played sports and that's when I learned that uh, not about you it's about the team because uh, that's what what it takes to get through life and of course uh, I think my my minister and then on into the military uh, various uh, leaders in the Marine Corps okay you were president of your high school freshman and senior classes at Cheshire High School yes that's correct and tell us about the day uh, military recruiters came to your school, <laughs> why you became a Marine. Okay, well, I guess, <laughs> you know, on, uh, on uh, career day in, uh, in high school, they had all the, all the juniors and seniors in the, in the auditorium. And they had all the, the recruiters come in. And the Army recruiter got up and gave his pit spiel. And there was a lot of whistles and calls and cat calls. And the Air Force got up and the Navy got up. And the students were really giving them the old raspberry. Well, this old Marine Gunny got up, and he says, I want to tell you, there's no one in this room that I want my Marine Corps. You're undisciplined. I'm disappointed with you. Then he began to chew out the faculty in the back of the room <laughs> for letting the guys get out of hand. Picked up his gear and walked off the stage. Well, at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the, uh, uh, the auditorium, I was one of 13 guys who went up and stood at his table, and he put his table back together, and we talked, and 
I signed up in 1958 and joined the United States Marine Corps. Very good. Good story. Here was a gunny sergeant who knew what had to be done, had a mission, was proud of who he represented, wasn't going to take any shenanigans. And I said, you know what? I think I'd like to be like that guy. <laughs> Sergeant Morris, you were raised in Okmulgee, correct? Oklahoma. Uh, tell us about your early life and your, your early uh, role models when you were growing up there. Uh, excuse me. My, uh, my role model was an uncle of mine, and he was a paratrooper in the uh, triple nickel, which was a segregated airborne unit at that time. But, you know, I was so impressed, uh, you know, just looking at him in uniform and that he's jumping out of a perfectly good airplane. And, um, and you want to do that. Yeah. That was my inspiration to become a paratrooper. But my, con my condition is about the same as his. I owe it all to my family and my father because we hunted. We were economically depressed. Mm -hmm. And in my early days, I learned to hunt and fish. Still do. <laughs> uh, but you know, I learned my skills. I was also a Boy Scout <clears throat> uh, and an uh, Explorer Scout. So I took those values that I learned with me into the military. Now, I joined the National Guard in 1959. Uh, didn't see no recruiter, but I had gotten my uh, draft card. And uh, I didn't have to worry about that because we had already made our mind up to go into the National Guard because at that time, it was completely integrated and they were recruiting minorities. And so I joined the National Guard and did my basic and my AIT. And uh, I fell in love with the military. So up on uh, completing my advanced individual, individual training, which was infantry, I decided I want to go regular army. Mm -hmm. And I asked them, could I go regular army? And they said, of course. Yeah, but we'll take a strike from you. <laughs> Say, no problem, which they had to do anyhow. And so I joined the regular army and volunteered to go airborne. And uh, then after graduating from airborne school, I volunteered for the Green Beret. At mm -hmm. that time, it was called Special Forces. And um, the only thing I heard was Sneaky Pete. And I heard about what they do, and I said, well, I've done a lot of this. I spent all my time in the woods hunting, you know. And uh, I didn't think they were going to pick me up, and they did. And uh, I went to uh, Green Beret, and I was 19 years old, and I was private first class. Five foot four and 117 pounds. Mm -hmm. I was barely big enough, you know, to open a parachute when I went to jump school. But, you know, I managed to stay there for, uh, from 61 until 1982. And uh, I was there when JFK... Uh, authorized the Green Beret, October 1961. I still have that same beret today. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my passion, It's being a Green Beret. And I will not get, get rid of it. And people say, well, you need to get rid of that beret. Never, never, never. <laughs> no, that's with me for life. Good for you. Uh, Why don't you talk to us about the Green Berets and how your role as a Green Beret may have been different from the Marine Corps, the Army, the other uh, military forces in Vietnam at the time? Uh, you know, I've been asked that. Really, we all operate as brothers, as a brotherhood. And it's, you know, it's how, how you're disciplined and, and what kind of values and moral character you have. Uh, you know, the Marines, they have their Pacific mission. Uh, Green Beret have their Pacific mission, so does the Navy, the Air Force. Uh, but in token, we all brothers. And it, it's not competition between the servants when it comes to combat. It's, it's the thing of working together and getting the job done. Uh, of course, they'll send Marines in to do things that nobody else will do, and uh, which we'll laugh about, though. <laughs> No, but the Marine Corps is, is really designed to, you know, take on the tough stuff. And uh, yeah, in the Green Beret, uh, 
our mission was to train, advise, assist, and direct. And a lot of people always look at us as combat soldiers. No, that's not it. We were, we were teachers and advisors. Mm -hmm. That's our primary mission. And we'll either fight until the regular infantry, the armor, uh, whoever, Marine Corps. But, uh, you know, the same thing that's going on over in uh, Iraq right now, we have a special force set of Green Berets, and they are advising, and they are training, and they are directing, and they are assisting. And uh, that's our, that was our primary goal. Thank you. Uh, Colonel Barnum, you were in the Medal of Honor uh, for an action. Uh, you were in Vietnam only about 10 days, is that correct? And you served a second tour of duty. Why did you go back a second time? Well, uh, yeah, I, I was in Vietnam uh, 10 days, was with the unit four days when I was in that ambush. And uh, and ended up with uh, Medal of Honor. They really pissed me off, you know. So I got <laughs> but anyways, no, I and I came home, and um, I uh, became an aide to uh, the assistant commandant of the Marine Corps. And he says, Barnum, if you can last a year with me as an aide, you can go any place in the world for orders. A year was up, thirteen months was up. I went to the general. I said, General. Time for my orders. He said, that's right. Where do you want to go? I said, Vietnam. You can't go to Vietnam. You got the Medal of Honor first time. Medal of Honor recipients don't go back. I said, General, you told me if I lasted uh, a year with you, I could go any place I wanted. And I said, uh, you know, there's a war going on. I'm a professional Marine. That's where I should be. So General Walt did what generals do, and I went back. And I became the battery commander of the same battery I was a forward observer in the first time. Okay. Sergeant Morris, it was only um, earlier this year that you were decorated with the Medal of Honor. What was your reaction when you got the news? Well, I didn't believe it. Uh, and I never really worried about it. I never thought about it. And I uh, had already received the nation's second highest decoration, so. Uh, you know, and I thought that was far as it was, was going to go. And I just continued to march. I didn't worry about anything else. And then I got a call from um, G1, Colonel Davis, over here in the Pentagon. And um, he said, uh, well, the high government official is going to speak to you tomorrow. You need to be standing by the phone. And the first thing that came to my mind it was the men in black. <laughs> I said, I've done something wrong, you know. <laughs> and uh, I got a little nervous about it. So the next day the phone rang, and the colonel got on the phone. He said, this high government official uh, will speak to you now. And, I, you know, my mind is flying. And so it was President Obama got on the phone, and he said, well, this is President Obama. And, uh, you know, kind of like <laughs> I almost dropped to the floor. And he said, uh, I want to apologize to you for not receiving the Medal of Honor 44 years ago. Uh, you should have received it then. You know, a little short conversation, that was it. And I still couldn't believe it. And I told my wife, I said, I'm going to call this colonel back. And I called him back the next day. And I asked him, was this a prank? <laughs> he said, look, if the president tell you that this is official, it's official. Don't you ever call back up here no more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was it, yeah. Uh, let's talk about military leadership if, for both of you gentlemen. Thinking back <clears throat> over the many years, uh, who are the, the military leaders that you most admire and why? Why don't you give us a few examples? Yeah, who not the, the, the military, The military leaders in history that you most admire. Hmm. I had... Uh, so many uh, that it's hard for me to distinguish. Uh, but one that I most uh, admired uh, because he was a uh, hard ass, and that was General William uh, P. Yarborough. And uh, <laughs> reason why I admired him because I had a bad experience with him. Uh, he was our commanding general, mm -hmm. and uh, you know I'm a E4 and I have to do extra duties on the weekend. And I was thumbing home. I always walked home 10 miles. Didn't have a car, couldn't afford one. And he caught me thumbing. And he offered me five bucks 
to take a cab. And I refused his money, and I refused to ride. And I got back to duty Monday morning, and they called me up to headquarters and said, don't you ever refuse anything from the general. You go out and get the five-gallon buckets of whitewash and a brush, <laughs> and you start painting all these buildings. <laughs> so that's who I most admired, because okay. he meant what he meant, don't thump. <laughs> You know, uh, there are so many because uh, uh, in, in our glorious core, we're small. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, but I worked for people like uh, General Lou Walt, who uh, uh, two Navy crosses on Peleliu, uh, was my division commander who recommended me for the Medal of Honor and was the assistant commandant of the Marine Corps who I was an aide for and, and, and sent me back to Vietnam. Then I think of General Ray Davis. Mm -hmm. Medal of Honor recipient, chosen yeah. reservoir. Yeah. My second tour was my division commander. Uh, I uh, never served with Chesty Puller, but I was in his presence a number of times, and I sat in awe of that man because of all he's accomplished. So, and I think the, I'd like to add to this. You all are wearing the uniform of our great country. You're not on active duty yet. Some of you will be active duty. Some of you will be congressmen and senators, and if you are, I hope you get something done. <laughs> Some of you will be doctors, lawyers, school teachers, firemen, policemen, CEOs of multi-billion dollar companies, and some of you have the opportunity to wear that cloth of our nation and serve in the defense of the state. And because you're college, going to be college graduates, you will be officers, and you will be charged with leadership. And the young whippersnappers who you will get to lead will be looking up to you. You're on parade 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you're going to be in the military, know yourself, be good at what you're doing, and, and lead by example. And then you will be looked at someday. When that question is asked, one of your troopers someday, he's going to say, Colonel so-and-so, General so-and-so, Admiral so-and-so. And one of you admirals or generals are sitting right here, so remember that. That's what this is all about. And that's what Marv Melvin and I are here today. Mm -hmm. We want to jumpstart you. Mm -hmm. Start thinking downrange. Not yesterday. You can't change yesterday. You can affect tomorrow. So you are building that strong foundation upon which you're going to build the walls of life. That's what we're here to do today. Yeah. Thank you. One final question, and then I'll open it up to the audience. Uh, Colonel Barnum, we talked earlier. Yesterday marks the 10th anniversary of the uh, Battle of Fallujah in Iraq. And like yeah, I, you know, that. we're talking about Vietnam, and, and we, we had uh, some Korean War and Vietnam veterans here. You just had some World War II people, the Skiki Airmen. You know, the reason we're at war at times is because there are people who do not believe in what you and I believe in. They want to take us down. They want to take this great country down. But by God, we ain't going to let them do it. So that's the reason we have a military prepared to go any place at any time, take on these turkeys, win, and come home. Well, if you look back 10 years ago, the Second Battle of Fallujah, Operation Fajar or Phantom Fury, was from 7 November to 24 December, 2004. The bloodiest battle of the Iraq War, 82 of the 12,000 troops who took part in that battle were killed in action. Another 600 wounded. Estimated 2,000 insurgents killed. Another 1,200 captured. There were 3,500 to 4,000 fugitives in the city when the battle began. The focus of our Marines and the sacrifices they made, as we did in Vietnam, the Marines did their job. And they did it well. And the Marines today and the soldiers today will be prepared to take on the next Fallujah. God forbid that it ever comes. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll open it up for questions. Remember, the only dumb question is the one you forget to answer. Or ask. And you think about it as you're going out the door. Yeah. You can ask her any question. Yeah, I have a, I'll make a comment. Okay. Uh, this is for the cadets. 
You, you know, if you can't uh, follow, you can't lead. So uh, you got to set the example for the people that you're going to command. And you got to be able to get their willingness and obedience. Uh, you know, you're going to have to treat your troops fairly. Uh, you're going to have to be understandable. Uh, you're going to have to be knowledgeable. I'm, I'll, I'll tell you this, since I was in the military so long, and infantry, you know, they will see your weakness if you don't have what it takes. So it's the best you prepare yourself properly. And once you lose that ability to lead, you're no good. You're no good. Remember that. You got to stay on top of your game and, you know, develop all the knowledge and skills that you can possibly uh, gain. Uh, if you are doing the right and proper job, your troops will see you as a leader. They will follow you unwillingly. I mean, willingly. Uh, they will be obedient. And think about it. How can you tell a man to go into harm's way if you don't have their confidence? You must gain their confidence. And so, you know, uh, you it's hard, I know. You got to keep the uh, high standards, high moral values, and you got to care for your people. Yeah, I want to pass it on to you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is uh, for the Colonel, and I'd like to ask the Colonel about how his battery reacted once he went back to Vietnam. Well, when I went back to Vietnam, uh, I had a 105 uh, artillery battery. And uh, of course, the troops were in awe. And I got them together and I said, OK, guys, I earned the Medal of Honor the first time. I'm here as a captain now, as a battery commander. We have a mission. I'm your leader. I'm going to give the orders. You execute them. Now, I'm going to tell you, you're going to have visitors come to this battery because of this. Not because of Captain Barnum. It's Captain Barnum that ha happens to have the Medal of Honor. And believe me, you're going to get sick of it. And they all sort of, you know, they, Gunny told me they thought that was pretty funny. Well, uh, they had to keep the battery area policed up and all because they never know when a general was going to stop in. Or a movie star or a football fan. So, um, but uh, on into the battle, uh, they've, they learned real quick that I stood up for them. And I think the day I turned the battle is, the uh, chief of staff of the Marine Corps, General Buse, was visiting a fire base. And the order was, the uniform will be bush hats. Well, I've been trying to get bush hats and green t-shirts under your, your, your utility uniform for two months. The artillery, trying to get them. They wouldn't give them to me. The infantry had them. The artillery didn't. So. I fall out in a helmet and an, and an old black T-shirt. And uh, Colonel Barrow, who was the regimental commander, went on to become of the Marine Corps, called me aside and he said, the uniform is bush hats and green T-shirts. I said, General, I mean, Colonel, I've been trying to get bush hats and green T-shirts for my troops for two months. He says, well, we sent up a bush hat and a green T-shirt for you to wear today. I said, unless all my troops had them, I ain't wearing them. <laughs> Word got out. The skipper's taken care of. That's it. Good start. Okay. Good. Thank you. Question here? Uh, this question is for both gentlemen, but particularly Colonel Barnum. Last night we were heard the riveting story of, uh, of Sergeant Jeremiah Workman. And afterwards, somebody asked him a question, which is a question I would ask you gentlemen, and it was about fear. His story is unbelievable, as both of your stories are. Being a Marine, he uh, was uncomfortable with admitting if he did have fear. But I would ask the two of you, it's not only the question of fear, but uh, other emotions. When you, especially as, a, as, a, as an officer, in leading men, how do you deal, how did you deal with, if you had fear, you probably didn't, Colonel Barnum, but if you did, how did, how did you deal with that, overcome it? But not only fear, but another emotion is uh, sadness, uh, maybe anxiety, especially in, in losing your, your other men in your unit. But it's for both of you, gentlemen. Yeah, Norm, uh, thank you very much. That's a great question, because it's something for you all to think about. 
you know, war is uh, horrifying and not glorifying. I want you all to realize that. First of all, I know Jeremiah Workman. I was at Bethesda when he was brought back. He was shot up pretty bad. And there's a young uh, staff sergeant at the time that really grabbed the whole of his bootstraps, tightened them up, and got on with life. And he's done very well. And he has fought PTSD, and he's helping other uh, Marines and Navy corpsmen who have PTSD. Fear. Well, I got to tell you, I'm on that, coming out of the mountains that day, fourth day into the operation, and we got ambushed. First time I'd ever been shot at. Well, I hit the deck. Very prudent thing to do. And when I looked up, all those Marines were looking at me, okay, Lieutenant, what are we going to do? Was I scared? You damn right I was scared. First time I'd ever been shot at. Were those troops scared? Damn right they were scared. That is emotion. But at that point, I went into action as an officer, leader of Marines. I started doing what needed to be done. The thing is with fear is how you control that fear. You've got to control it. You're going to have it. You've got to control it so it doesn't interfere with you making the right decision at the right time for the right reasons. It doesn't prevent you from mission accomplishment, giving the right orders to the troops to take out the enemy. If I didn't come out from underneath that helmet and stand up and start giving orders, those troops, that fear would have consumed them. All I had to do is kick them in the butt and then put reins on them and guide them. There was no fury unleashed like a bunch of Marines whose company commander has been killed and their buddies have been wounded. But I had to jumpstart them. Was I scared? You better believe it. But my background, my training, enabled me to control that fear. And that is the most important part. Sadness, uh, I'll tell you, it wasn't until the end of the battle that I, that I broke down. When the gunny came to me with the dog tags of those who had been killed, and we had a account for everybody. I went to pieces in private with the gunny, not in front of anybody. We're human beings. You've got to know we have emotions. You've got to know how to control them. Uh, going back with him, uh, you have to channel your fear. And you can turn your fear into a useful tool. Uh, you just got to learn how to deal with it. Uh, I'm a little different from him. He says scared. Okay. I don't use the word scared because when you're scared, you can't do nothing. And he said he hit the deck. That was scared. But, you know, fear. That was common sense. Fear. Common <laughs> sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I was a uh, company advisor myself. And uh, if I was a, a afraid, had a lot of fear, I couldn't do my job because they were looking for me to lead and make all the right decisions. Uh, anytime you're leading troops, they're watching you, and you got to make the right right calls. You make bad judgment calls. Uh, you'll cause people to lose their lives. Uh, but being scared, uh, I guess it's, it's, it's something I never thought about. Uh, because, you know, your, your adrenaline is, is rushing and it's giving you the extra strength. It's challenging you to do things. And uh, it takes over. And uh, I guess it caught, depending on the situation, is whether you are fearful or scared. Uh, I was fearful all the time. And fear makes you do the right thing. You know, but being, you know, you, you heard the term scared to death. Yeah. I've seen uh, people get scared where they couldn't do nothing. But fear you can challenge, you can control. You know, that's all I can tell you. Yeah, it's semantics, too. Um, but I think you know what we're, we're, what we're both saying. The, the other concern, rather than fear I had, that when I was in command, that I'd make the right decisions and get the job done and get fewer Marines hurt or injured. And it's pretty tough to make a decision when I tell you four to take out that machine gun and you get mowed down, and I turn to the next four and says, okay, you get them. Because we have to take out that machine gun or we're all going to go. Those are the type fears, uh, scared, concerns. It's semantics. But the whole thing is emotions 
that you have to be able to control. And as a leader, you got to stand up, be seen. You don't say, go do this. You say, follow me. That's what, that's what he was saying. I have a brief question for both gentlemen. Um, what does being able to wear the Medal of Honor mean to you? What does it mean to your family? And what does it mean to the men you fought side by side with? Well, to me, I mean, uh, uh, humility. There, there's no greater pride for me than anything in the world. Uh, I never would believe it would happen. But you know, uh, the word is to wear the Medal of Honor. You to receive it. It changes your life. Uh, what you used to be, you're, you're not anymore. You're a different person. And you have to expect your life is going to be completely changed, and mine has. Uh, you know, you're a national treasure when you receive the Medal of Honor, uh, uh, either a very high decoration. And people are watching you. They're looking at you. And actually, you're setting an example for the rest of the people. You know, and so it's, it's an honor to wear uh, but you know you got to walk a straight line. You got to walk a straight line, and you're an inspiration to the younger generation. You know, and I was telling someone we just left uh, Birmingham for a lot of the students. A lot of students don't even know what the Medal Honor is, uh, what it represents. And so you can have that knowledge. Please give them a little push and uh, a little education, because you know. I read something the other day, if, if this nation doesn't honor its heroes, we are done. Mm -hmm. We are doomed. Okay. Well, it is a great honor. And the greatest honor was when I was standing there and the Secretary of the Navy was put, presenting, putting it around my neck. I was looking at mom and dad in tears, mm. and I made them proud. To me, that was the highest moment because I made them proud. I put them through hell. You know, <laughs> as the priest said, you know, your mother is worn out three pairs of stockings on the kneeler from praying. Mm -hmm. And then I stayed in the Marine Corps, and I, and I wore this my whole time. But I've worn this medal in honor of those great Marines and phenomenal corpsmen that I got to lead on the field of battle. I never used it for my own benefit. I never used it to get a, 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 my orders changed, get a job. I'd be naive to believe that this didn't help me with some of the jobs I had because some general decided I want that Medal of Honor guy. Like General Walt wanted me to be his aide. Not because Barney Barnum, <laughs> Captain, Barney Barnum of the Medal of Honor. You're up on a pedestal. It's not just Captain Barnum, Major Barnum, Colonel Barnum. It's Barnum with the medal. So you're on parade. People are looking at you. And, you're, and you know, I, was, I had a recruit training battalion at Paris Island. And in two years, I trained 12,000 unorganized, unmotivated, overweight civilians into being hard charged and low crawling United States Marines. <laughs> and the people in the PX said, you know what? We know when the 2nd Battalion graduates because all the recruits come in there and all the cigars sell out. I always had a cigar in my mouth. <laughs> they emulated me because they <clears throat> respected me. They wanted to be like me. That's an awesome responsibility. The troops look up to you that way. So, as General Chapman said, the Marines do things that they're supposed to do and don't do things they're not supposed to do. I followed General Chapman's edict and did what I was supposed to do because I was leadership by example. Great, thank you. This is for both of you. Um, and you have addressed this to a certain extent. Uh, what effect did the upbringing by your parents uh, your church, your uh, the hunting, fishing that you did growing up, how much did that help you become what you became? Well, uh, uh, you know, it gave me the, the moral, morals and the, and the values and, and the standards to live by. And uh, yeah, uh, even as the days, it's a little more now because the change in my life from the Medal of Honor, though. But, you know, it's, it's the way you live. And, uh, you know, with the hardship I came up with in my youth, uh, that also uh, helps you to do things. Uh, you know, not joking, you know, I spent a lot of time eating rabbit and squirrel, right? 
<laughs> I learned to hunt when I was a small kid because it was necessary, you know. And I knew how hard my father and my parents were having because we were economically depressed. And, you know, and I had the foresight just to do the right thing, uh, you know. And, uh, but most of all, it, it helped me develop the character I needed to go through life. And I still use the same tools today. Mm -hmm. Well, I concur. I think, um, and let me segue the, the answer to this into my closing remark. My parents, my scoutmaster, my priests, my coaches, they helped me build the foundation of life. Upon that foundation now, I've been building walls, college, Marine Corps career. Now I'm a grandpa. I'm putting a roof on the house. <laughs> <laughs> but the roof on the house and the walls would fall down if I didn't have a strong foundation. Mm -hmm. Okay? You are all now climbing a ladder of life. And because you're into uh, college, you're up on about rung five or six. And I encourage you and charge you to set your goals high, way high, then always reach out to get those goals as you continue to climb that ladder of life. Never say it's too hard. Never say I can't. For God's sake, take the word failure out of your vocabulary. There isn't anything that you want to accomplish that you can't if you put your mind to it. I got to tell you, there ain't no free lunch out there. You got to work for what you get. The greatest country in the world, if you work hard, it's going to be there. So if you're going to be a bear, be a grizzly bear, all right? And I just want to say, uh, think about those things that Melvin and I have said. We're sharing them with you because we're experiencing them. We want you to have a great life living in the greatest country in the world. We've had a great life. Mm -hmm. Have there been challenges? Have there bump bumps in the road? Hell yeah. But look at us. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make yeah. one more, <clears throat> one more comment, comment, and it's just an example about leadership. You know, uh, after I received the Medal of Honor, my uh, radio operator from Cambodia found me after 45 years. Uh, my interpreter, yeah, you know, they're getting everybody together. I mean that, you know, they actually they admired me. And they still do today. And I carry the pictures in my wallet that your, your foreign troops even give you the respect that you never thought you had. So after 45 years, I'm on the telephone with my foreign troops. That's all. That's part of leadership. You know, I cared for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what it's all about. Okay. Well, I'd like... Well, on behalf of the American Veterans Center, I'd like to personally thank uh, Colonel Barnum and Sergeant Morris for a great session this morning. We thank you very much for being here and your time. Thank all of you for participating today, and lunch is served. Thank you.